Now, uh, allow me to introduce our guest for today. Uh, Professor Jim Sturba comes to us from Notre Dame University. He is uh, probably one of the most important people working in the field of applied ethics and political philosophy in the United States. He was telling us earlier uh, today about one of his summer trips where he actually spent the summer at Harvard working with John Rawls and Michael Sandel, who are, uh, anybody that knows anything about philosophy, like that's amazing to rub, rub shoulders with those guys. Um, and then he's been spending the entire day talking to us about almost every issue under the sun, <laughs> and we never gave him a chance to relax. He came to, he came to a class earlier and argued about, um, about breaking the law. And uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, he, he's written a shelf load of books. The talk today is, I believe, uh, part of a forthcoming book on the same topic, uh, Rationality and Equality, which is going to be published by Oxford University Press in 2013. He's been past president of the Central Division of the American Philosophical Association. He's been president of the North American Society for Social Philosophy. He's been president of the, uh, the group called Concerned Philosophers for Peace, which is one dear to my heart, because a year from now, we're going to host the meeting. I don't know if, I, if you, knew, you knew this, but we're hosting the meeting of Concerned Philosophers for Peace here in Yosemite. So that'll be next October. So anyway, the title for the talk is, let me get it exactly right, from Rationality to Substantial Equality. Professor Sturba, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Andy, for that kind introduction. Um, and I, I love this opportunity to get a chance to get some feedback on my work. And I think the argument is will be challenging to you. And so Jim, the I'm questions. Sorry, Jim. Can, can we? I think we should use the microphone because we have some people with some hearing. Oh, okay. Problems. All right. We need to turn. But we don't oh, have to turn it off. Yeah. All right. That means I have to stay near it. Okay. Um, so um, um, I'm looking forward to getting some feedback on on the on my argument because it's a fairly challenging argument and. Since it's got fairly challenging conclusions, there must be something wrong with its premises somewhere. But I haven't been able to figure out what it is yet. Maybe this will be the, my opportunity for enlightenment. Um, now, it's generally recognized that in today's society, academic philosophers have very little impact on moral and political decision making. For example, in contrast to members of other disciplines and professions, philosophers have very rarely in our times been called upon to serve as advisors to governors, labor leaders, presidents, prime ministers, or even dictators. To some extent, this is because philosophers have not, until recently, directed their attention at the practical issues that daily concern our moral and political leaders. But just as importantly, it is because philosophers have done so little to resolve the fundamental conflicts between opposing moral and political ideals of our times. In this talk, I will try to improve upon the status of my profession just a bit by offering a justification for morality, and further, by showing how morality so justified leads to a demand for substantial equality. Now, to defend or justify morality, it would be helpful to show that morality is grounded in rationality. This requires not just showing that morality is simply rationally permissible, because that would imply that egoism or immorality were rationally permissible as well. Rather, what needs to be shown is that morality is rationally required, thus excluding egoism and immorality as rationally permissible. I begin my argument for morality by imagining each of us is capable of entertaining and acting upon both self-interested and moral or altruistic considerations. And the question we are seeking to answer is what considerations it would be rational for us to accept as reasons for action. This question is not about what considerations we should publicly affirm as reasons for action, since people will sometimes publicly affirm considerations as reasons for action that are quite different from those they are prepared to act upon. Rather, it is a question about what considerations would be rational for us to accept as reasons for action at the deepest level in our heart of hearts, since we are trying to answer this question as far as possible without self-deception or hypocrisy. In trying to determine how we should act, I assume we would like to be able to construct a good argument 
favoring morality over egoism. And given that good arguments are non question begging, they do not just assume what they are trying to prove. In a film by Sacha Guitry, three thieves are arguing over the division of some very valuable pearls. One of the thieves gives two to the thief on his right, then two to the thief on his left. I, he says, will keep three. How come you get to keep three? One of the other two thieves says. Because I am the leader, he replies. Oh, but how come you are the leader, the other thief asks. Because I have more pearls, he replies. <laughs> In the film, this question-begging argument that assumes just what it purports to prove surprisingly satisfies the two thieves because they do not further question how the pearls have been distributed. However, let's assume that we would like to do better by constructing a good argument for morality that does not similarly beg the question. The question issue here is what reasons each of us should take as supreme. And this question would be begged against egoism if we propose to answer it simply by assuming from the start that moral reasons are the reasons that each of us should take as supreme. But the question would be begged against morality as well if we propose to answer the question assuming, simply by assuming from the start that self-interested reasons are the reasons that each of us should take as supreme. This means, of course, that we cannot answer the question of what reasons we should take as supreme simply by assuming the general principle of egoism, which is each person ought to do what best serves his or her overall self-interest. We could no more argue for egoism simply by denying the relevance of moral reasons to rational choice than we could argue for altruism simply by denying the relevance of self-interested reasons to rational choice and assuming the following general principle of altruism, which is each person ought to do what best serves the overall interests of others. Consequently, in order not to beg the question, we have no alternative but to grant the prima facie relevance of both self-interested and more altruistic reasons to rational choice, and then try to determine which reasons we'd be rationally required to act upon, all things considered. Notice that in order not to beg the question, it is necessary to back off both from the general principle of egoism and from the general principle of altruism, thus granting the prima facie relevance of both self-interested and altruistic reasons to rational choice. From this standpoint, it is still an open question whether either egoism or altruism will be rationally preferable, all things considered. In this regard, there are two kinds of cases that must be considered. Cases in which there's a conflict between the relevant self-interested and moral altruistic reasons, and cases in which there's no such conflict. It seems obvious that where there is no conflict, and both reasons are conclusive reasons of their kind, recommending the same course of action, both reasons should be acted upon. In such contexts, we should do what is favored both by morality or altruism and by self-interest. Now, when we rationally assess the relevant reasons in conflict cases, it's best to cast the conflict not as a conflict between self-interested reasons and moral reasons, but instead as a conflict between self-interested reasons and altruistic reasons. Viewed in this way, three solutions are possible. First. We could say that self-interested reasons always have priority over conflicting altruistic reasons. Second, we could say just the opposite, that altruistic reasons always have priority over conflicting self-interested reasons. Third, we could say that some kind of compromise is rationally required. In this compromise, sometimes self-interested reasons have priority over conflicting altruistic reasons, and sometimes altruistic reasons have priority over conflicting self-interested reasons. Now, once the conflict is described in this manner, the third solution can be seen to be the one that is rationally required. This is because the first and second solutions give exclusive priority to one class of relevant reasons over the other, and only a question-begging justification can be given for such an exclusive priority. Only by employing the third solution, and sometimes giving priority to self-interested reasons, and sometimes giving priority to altruistic reasons, can we avoid a question-begging resolution? Let us call this third solution, morality is compromise. Notice also that the standard of rationality will not support just any compromise between relevant self-interested and altruistic reasons. The compromise must be a non-arbitrary one. 
Well, otherwise, it would beg the question with respect to the opposing egoistic and altruistic perspectives. Such a compromise would have to respect the rankings of self-interested and altruistic reasons imposed by the egoistic and altruistic perspectives, respectively. Accordingly, any non-arbitrary compromise among such reasons in seeking not to beg the question against either egoism or altruism would have to give priority to those reasons that rank highest in each category. Failure to give priority to the highest ranking altruistic or self-interested reasons would, other things being equal, be contrary to reason. Now, it might be objected here that my argument just assumes that we can provide an objective ranking of both a person's self-interested and altruistic reasons. This is correct. But it's difficult to see how any defender of egoism could deny this assumption. Egoism claims that each of us ought to do what best serves his or her overall self-interest. And this clearly assumes that each of us can know what that is. Nor is it plausible to interpret egoism as maintaining that while we can each know what best serves our own self-interest, we cannot know what best serves the interests of others. And that's why we should be egoists. Rather, the standard defense of egoism assumes that we can each know what is good for ourselves and what is good for others, and then claims that even with this knowledge, we still always ought to do what is good for ourselves. Nor is the idea of providing a relatively precise ranking of one's self-interested reasons from an egoistic perspective, or a relatively precise ranking of one's altruistic reasons from an altruistic perspective, something to which an egoist could reasonably object. Nor would the egoist reasonably object to the interpersonal comparability of these rankings. Difficult though such rankings may be to arrive at in practice, the ego's objection is that even when such relatively precise rankings of our self-interested and altruistic reasons are known, and even when it is known that acting on high-ranking altruistic reasons is comparably more beneficial to others than acting on conflicting low-ranking self-interested reasons is beneficial to ourselves, we should still always favor self-interested reasons or altruistic ones. Now, we can see how morality can be viewed as just as a non-question-begging compromise between self-interested and altruistic reasons. First, a certain amount of self-regard is morally required, and sometimes, if not morally required, at least morally acceptable. Where this is the case, high-ranking self-interested reasons have priority over conflicting low-ranking altruistic reasons, other things being equal. Second, morality obviously places limits on the extent to which people should pursue their own self-interest. Where this is the case, high-ranking altruistic reasons have priority of conflicting low-ranking self-interested reasons, other things being equal. In this way, morality can be seen to be a non-question-begging compromise between self-interested and altruistic reasons. And the moral reasons that constitute that compromise can be seen as having a priority over the self-interested or altruistic reasons that conflict with them, other things being equal. Now, while morality as compromise can thus be seen as rationally preferable to both egoism and altruism, and so helps to establish the justification of morality over these two perspectives, it is anything but a complete moral perspective. In particular, it does not clearly specify when its requirements can be coercively enforced. So we do need to go further and address the enforcement of morality question. Here, it behooves us to start with the assumptions of the libertarian perspective, the view that appears to endorse the least enforcement of morality. Given that I propose to show that this view, contrary to what its defenders usually maintain, requires a right to welfare, and that further, this right to welfare, which is also endorsed by a welfare liberal perspective, leads to the substantial equality of a socialist perspective. So far, I've argued from a conception of rationality as non-question beggingness to the incomplete moral perspective of morality as compromise. Now I will argue that completing this conception of morality with respect to the enforcement question leads to substantial equality. Let us begin by interpreting the idea